My name is Abby. I'm deeply passionate about all things wild and have made it my mission to explore and document many of the world's most stunning landscapes through human-powered adventure. Each quest is totally unique. Some traverse exposed moorlands and rugged mountain tops. Others whiz through bustling market towns and historical cities. They see me dive down deep amongst marine life, follow world-renowned archaeological discoveries, and travel through some of the most tranquil valleys and mystical forests accessible on foot. My goal is always one of discovery and awareness. Getting outside is now more important than ever before, with obesity rates maintaining record highs and mental health issues affecting over one in four individuals. In building an archive of films, I aim to leave you looking for a challenge, ready to break free from the monotony of everyday life and be inspired by nature enough to want to give back. Ultimately, I want to see you don your adventure boots and spend more time in the wild for the benefit of mental and physical health. I've realised that sometimes you don't have to do something crazy or radical to change how you feel about your life. You just have to get up and get out. I face my own trials with mental ill health and chronic pain, as no doubt you'll see throughout my travels. But alongside building a strong support network, getting outside and taking the time to reconnect with nature has helped me move further along the road of personal discovery. So, here's me inviting you to join me on my adventures as I explore this awe-inspiring planet. There will be hardships along the way, and we're not guaranteed to succeed, but it takes a brave heart and a courageous soul to commit to the unknown. Now all you have to do is decide that you want it more than you are afraid of it. Are you ready? Let's go. This is the official start of the West Highland Way, which just so happens to be the first trail designated in Scotland in 1980. Now for me, it's become a bit of a pilgrimage, a rites of passage, so we say. I've walked it twice already and I'm back for a third time. But this time, I'm not just walking the way in order to tell my own personal story. I'm here to tell the story of the people who are walking the way. Why are they here? What makes this route so popular, so special? But well, we're gonna find out within the six days from here at the start of the route in Mulgai as we walk through the highlands towards Fort William. That morning, I had caught an early flight from Bristol to Glasgow and then a train to Mulgai, where the route officially begins. My contact with other hikers began early on in my travels as I met several folk on similar itineraries. I couldn't wait to hear what they had to say about the trail after we had some miles under our belts. Unbeatable. Well used. Phenomenal. Enchanting. Overwhelming. Amazing. Cleansing. Piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> Show on the road. My name is Max. I'm from Devon, and I've come to walk the West Highland Way to see the very best of what the British Isles has to offer. I'm looking forward to camping along the way as well, wild camping. So I, I could really feel self-sufficient, independent, and almost back to basics in, in, in my nature. Um, so the only thing I have to worry about is how much water I have or how far I have to walk. This sort of thing is probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done. So when I say, oh, I've walked 92 miles across the highlands and camping and self-sufficient along the way with a, with a 12 kilogram backpack on my back, that's, that, that's not something that you hear every day or do every day. It's actually quite a muggy day today. It's overcast and uh, I'm sweating. It's kind of drizzling a little bit too. But I'm enjoying this walking and as per usual, it takes a while to get used to the weight on your back. My base weight of my pack is around seven kilograms, but then the camera gear, water and food, well, then it becomes considerably more than that. <laughs> but I'm here and now it's just about finding peace and pace with the way. People have walked this route for thousands of years. It's historical, it's cultural. There's plenty to see along the way. And my job is really to immerse myself in the flavours, the textures of the West Highland Way. 
to showcase them to you and help you really understand that this is not just a 2D experience. This is multidimensional. This is real. And this is what modern day hiking and trekking can really be about. It's about nature, it's about community, and it's about that personal journey. Now officially leaving the obelisk and hustle and bustle of Morgai behind, the route wound its way through suburbs, a funny concoction of industry and nature. Alongside, a land of water flowed, which to me felt a bit like an old friend taking me by the hand as I trekked my first few miles along the way. It felt incredible to be able to breathe deeply and fill my lungs with a sense of anticipated adventure. Here we go, look. First proper sign on the West Highland Way. Public footpath, we're heading to Drimmen. Well, just beyond, actually. And that is this way. So talking of personal journeys, I first walked this trail in 2012. I was 16 years old with my mum, and it was the first long distance route I ever did. Came back in 2018, first walk I ever did solo, and I camped it back in 2022 and I'm here to wild camp the route. So you can see the levels of personal development along the way, and I've walked trails all around the world since then, but camping and wild camping in particular is still something I find a little bit difficult, but by coming here onto the West Hallam Way, it's a route that I'm very familiar, and so I feel really chill about the whole camping thing. My main concern is actually being able to find space because it is such a popular trail. Now the second reason why I'm here on this personal journey on the West Hallam Way is to basically find out my future. <laughs> um, many of you guys may have seen other films where I've mentioned my chronic pain that I deal with in my back and my neck and it has been made making hiking, backpacking and all things walking very difficult, very uncomfortable. So much so that I've actually been turning to cycling because I've been able to manage it more. But Backpacking and travel on foot is in my DNA, is a part of who I am. And I'm doing this trail to basically suss out whether backpacking is something I can do at the moment or whether I need to adapt and find another sport or activity because the pain is just too much for me to handle. So no pressure. Um, gonna give this 100% and the goal is really just to enjoy the pace, enjoy the nature, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the memories and of course, to meet many of the other inspirational people who are here to walk out their own stories as well. Soon enough, I was leaving Alanda Country Park in favour of the Crig Allen Loch, a popular fishing spot for locals and a great place for watching wildlife. Further on along the trail was the Crig Allen Fire Memorial, marking the site of an informal meeting point for travellers looking to escape the Great Depression in Glasgow and the Clyde in the 1920s and 30s. It was an interesting spot with a huge amount of cultural significance. From here, it was on along the way, past pines and chalets, all seemingly cheering us on as the miles started to tick away. Here we go, is our junction. As you can probably hear behind me, I've just left behind the B821, which is one of the tiny stretches along the West Highland Way. And the nice thing about this route is there really isn't very much tarmac walking at all. Unlike the Rob Roy Way, which for me is sort of the sister trail up here, uh, there's, that has a lot of road walking here. Not so much, we've got military paths, we've got drovers roads, we've got forestry tracks, uh, generally not tarmac. However, we are walking now towards Dumgoyak, which is right on the edge of the Camp Sea Fells. It's uh, one of the first sort of peaks that we get to see on our West Highland Way journey. And for me, coming through that gate is where this trip, this experience really begins. You know, the first day is mellow, it's steady, it's easy, it's a nice introduction. And we're shadowed in front of us by the highlands, the mountains through which we're gonna be walking.
the striking yellow of the gorse here. Just love it. Really partners very nicely with the grey sky. Here we go, across the bridge. I've just left my pack on the, the bridge here. We've got this waterway, this burn coming down and around me, this is wild garlic. This is one of my favorite things that you can find at this time of year, favorite plants. Now, essentially you can gather the leaves, you can gather the flowers and you can eat them. And it's very easy to tell what they are because they absolutely reek of garlic. They're very, very strong. The younger leaves are generally tastier and I'm gonna gather some for my dinner tonight. gather quite a bit there. I'm going to store that in there for dinner. So I've got my garlic and I've left behind the Dungoyak estate and I'm now on a very flat path. This is the route which the Blaine Valley Railway used to follow. So it's a former railway track essentially. That for me as a hiker means nice steady flat walking, kind of like canal walking, tranquil, peaceful, easy. Now the railway was in use between 1882 and 1951 and it was used to ferry passengers from Aberfoyle to Glasgow. Pretty major route nowadays. It just ferries hikers along the West Highland Way all the way through to Drimmen. That's actually where I'm looking to go today. Drimmen is the start of the Rob Roy Way and it's also a transition point where walkers can get some refreshments before they start to drop across Connick Hill and down to Balmahar in the shores of Loch Lomond. Now the shores of Loch Lomond, that's tomorrow, but it's said to be one of the more challenging stretches of the way. I can certainly testify to that, but we will get there when we get there. But for now though, let's just imagine we're on a steam chain, chuffing through the hills into the highlands. Well, I suppose most people were actually heading to Glasgow, but I'm heading to the mountains. Let's go. With the prospect of greater undulations ahead, I strove to take it easy along this first leg, a task that is simple to tick off with the likes of the Beech Tree Inn en route. The place is famous for its hospitality towards hikers, with free drinking water, snacks and cool visuals to cheer you on. Waffles are my favourite food to eat, whether I'm cycling or hiking. Don't ask me why, I just love them. And I have one now. I'm sat outside the uh, beech tree inn, using this rather handy bench, enjoying the sunshine. Rare thing in Scotland. Every single waffle. I mean, does life get any better than this? I don't know. Can just about see the mountains there ahead of us. Brilliant. Now, what do we have here then? Turnip the beet. <laughs> That's kind of cool. That's a new one for me. Things are springing up along the West Highland Way like nobody's business. It is a popular trail. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people come and walk this trail each year. And several years ago, before the pandemic, 36,000 people would complete the full trail. These days, it's probably considerably more since sort of outdoor pursuits, hiking in particular, has really, really taken off here in the UK. So, turn at the beat. Zero waste, good food, we like. German, four miles. Cute, cool. making good progress. And 50 meters up the road. German is still four miles. It wasn't long before I caught up with a number of other hikers. And rather than play the usual game of leapfrog, I chose to stick around for the banter. I love that everyone's like, oh, cool waterfall, and then they're like, oh, bridge! <laughs> Ice cream! <laughs> so, do you want a fab? I don't think 
<laughs> they named a lolly after me, look. Look at that. <laughs> Amazing. Are the ice creams good, guys? Do you recommend? I love it. Yeah. I'm Graham. John. From, Li from Liverpool. Yeah, from Liverpool as well. I dragged them along. <laughs> I just like I like walking. I like the social side of walking, and uh, I like the exercise, and I like keeping fit and the challenge and. You've got to do something rather than nothing and I'm 70 this year so I don't know how many more years I'll be able to walk so I want to get as much in as I can and uh, fill my life with meaningful stuff. I just think there's something uh, just different about going on a linear route where all you've got to yeah. do is make sure you get to the next point and it's very sort of like free and relaxing it's a great way to sort of like de-stress yeah people have people generally yeah. who go walking are very welcoming to anyone who wants to take yeah. it up so you've nothing to be you've nothing to be nervous about just do it back to walking by myself for a short while that's so good just a whole bunch of hikers just clumped together namely around the uh cooler box <laughs> containing ice creams <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, nice river, and then it's like, ice creams. Soon enough, I was passing Drimmen Camping, an ideal spot to end the day, in a place I was very much affiliated with. It actually felt odd walking on by, but moments later, I was easily distracted. This is where it starts, people. The views, the views. You can see here to the left of me, the mountains, the Scottish Highlands. We've got first sights over Loch Lomond with all of its islands. And perhaps most excitingly is Connick Hill and that's uh, one of the icons along the way just um, sitting above Balmahar on the shores of Loch Lomond very popular walking route actually got a video on that check it out Whew. and it also happens to be where we're heading let's see how close we get tonight then eh there we go road into Drimmen, which is just over there let's get across this one and away from the noise eh also i love this proper like west island way crossing very good go here we are and this is where we leave the road thankfully because it's noisy <laughs> Progress is going well, the weather could not be any better. Um, I've probably got about an hour and a half left, but I have to sort my feet out. I left that one for too long, I knew it was coming. I don't know what that is. And there's my little toe, which is kind of sad. And you can see, yeah, it's just been rubbing there. And then this foot, out. <laughs> just the same, not as bad. My little toe is worse, I'd say. See that whole front thing there is a bit of a blister. That's not cool for 12 miles. This walk is gonna hurt. Definitely should have got a size bigger, I knew it. I knew it. I am so unhappy about this. I can't believe my feet, day one. I am so hot on foot care. Get new boots, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Here we go, we've got the road with the signs that say the Rob Roy way. Look at that, hashtag memories and all that. Ugh. That was a bit of a slog coming up here from Drummond, trust me. And then you go up and up and up and up and up and up and up that way. Now nah, in all seriousness it's a very nice walk again, different again, different part of Scotland. It's, nice because one of my favorite places pit lockery is on the route the salmon ladder and uh good cafes there as well but let's not think about food too much otherwise i would just pitch right here and get some scarf in my tummy 
this is quite an important billboard actually. So obviously we're within the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park and this is to do with the camping management zones. So the eastern part of Loch Lomond is under camping management and that's to try and minimise wear and tear, erosion, bad use of the landscape. Um, so it means you can't camp basically from here to here within the 1st of March and the 30th of September. So outside of that you can. Now there are places you can buy permits and there are designated places where you can camp AKA campsites. Um, but for me, it doesn't bother me because I'm going to be walking on outside of that zone. But if you are planning to do this trip and to camp, that's really important to bear in mind. To be honest, that's quite a nice wild camping spot. Little burn coming down. And uh, same over there actually, there's one just tucked in there I'd say. But the nice thing is, is that just over the horizon, Loch Lomond. I have to be honest, it really is cool having uh, Connick Hill just there, domineering the horizon. So my name's Matt, I'm from Edinburgh. Well, we essentially thought it was like the world's longest pub crawl. Um, so uh, the idea is we're going to have a very sociable, um, also quite healthy, I hope, uh, long walk. And because I've done it a couple of times before, I'm, I'm statistically less likely to get lost than I was before. So I think it'll be, uh, it'll be good fun. Anytime you embark on like a, a hike, even if it's a day or if it's like this, five days, there's never a perfect time to go. There's always like a reason as to like why the weather might turn or um, you might have stuff on but just decide and then just go and once you're here everything else in life just seems to kind of diminish slightly more so uh, yeah I find that I worry less about stuff when I'm out here. Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Open country now. Conic Hill looming ahead. We're getting closer with every step. Naturally, that kind of is the trail. <laughs> yeah. So waving bye to these heroes, trooping on even further, and saying hello to this old friend. Hello. Yeah, honestly, this is a pretty... It's not bad, is it's it? Not, it's not a bad view. Yeah. So go, okay, day one is done. Camping in the foothills, if that's the right word, of Conic Hill. So we're going up there tomorrow, and then dropping down the other side to Balmaha. Um, it has been an interesting day for me actually. Normally when I'm hiking, I sort of keep myself to myself, but I know with the West Hanover Way, what well, with it being a very popular route, you kind of got to open your heart, yourself up a bit, open your heart up a little bit, that's what I'm trying to say, and let the people in. And everybody's here, they have a story, they're, they're walking for a reason, and it's been really cool just sort of stepping into that and just actually being sociable, I suppose. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I feel like I'm making some good pals here and already sad to see those two head on but this is the nature of it, we're all on different itineraries and now it's time to get my tent out and get a brew on I think. Let's just say I'm really glad that I bought flip flops because I can air my feet in the evening and not have to put these painful things on. All right, just heading away from camp. We're on the hill up there. Uh, not the hill, but the mound. Uh, just down to the burn here. It's time to filter some water. So I wanted to show you this. This is the water filter I'm using on this trip. So previously I've used a Sawyer Micro Squeeze and this one is actually a Catadyne B3. Uh, it's got one litre pouch and then the filter screws on top. And the reason why I've chosen to move across to this one is look at this. That flow rate is phenomenal. The Sawyer feels like it just drips through. It's, it's so tedious. But with this, I'm able to get through a couple of litres in a couple of minutes. Uh, it means the water is safe and clean to drink. It doesn't take the tannins out. It doesn't take the peaty colour out of it. But it makes it clean. So that's good. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. That was as brief as I'm feeling. Let's get into our sleeping bag.
almost forgot about this. These are my <laughs> dilapidated wild garlic pieces that I picked. So I'm just gonna break them up and put them in here for an added twang. Mixed in my wild garlic and this is the mulch that I'm left with. Now for the taste test. Oh, that garlic's got a kick to it. That is not bad though, actually, as far as camping food goes. That is going to go down very nicely. Good morning. It is day two on the West Ham Way. I have drunk my coffee, which was not very coffee-ish actually, but I've drunk it. Um, and the views over Loch Lomond have just been clearing and getting mind-bogglingly beautiful. Uh, I can see there's a bit of a mirror-like reflection and it's interesting because Connick Hill is now in the cloud actually. Um, but it's time to take down camp and get ready to go. It's kind of nice because my tent has been drying out. It didn't rain in the night, but condensation in this thing gets so bad because it's there was no wind at all. Um, and apparently maybe I breathe heavily, but I'm looking forward to this hike. Just got to get my feet wrapped up and put them in the boots as the last possible thing that I have to do to get ready. <laughs> okay, foot care time. Got my wee first aid kit. So I've got blister here, blister here. This heel is okay. But then this foot, blister here and blister here. Like that. Easy. Ready to go. All Get right, it done. Go. Nice one, mate. Happy hiking. I'll see you later. See you on the trail. Bye, campsite. I must stress that fire was not us. Let's get going up to Connick Hill. Over the bridge. Right. So, Connick Hill then, 361 metres above sea level. Now, the climb to the top from down there is about 170 metres, so the most significant climb so far on the way. But it's really not very steep. It's nice, steady, ploddable, shall we say. And uh, for me, a very nice way to start the morning. And you see we're just surrounded by these gently undulating summits here. All the shades of brown and beige. Who's down over Loch Lomond? Plenty more of those to come. All right, here's the top, or rather the path to the top. I'm going to be lazy and leave my backpack down here and run up. <laughs> leave that there. Oops, grab that. Leave that there. I'm actually quite surprised I'm doing this. I didn't think I was going to, but I am, apparently. Bizarre. I'm motivated. What is this feeling? <sighs> what you can see with this path is it's very eroded. Don't get me wrong, this is as exposed as it gets. So the rain, the wind, you know, causing an erosion, but also heavy footfall. This is a popular little peak to climb. So straightforward, and Clock Lomond is uh, a real hot spot for people visiting from Glasgow. So naturally, a lot of people, a lot of erosion. This is one of the problems that the Highlands is starting to really face. Mass usage, mass erosion. Oh, views on the other side. Yeah. So this is where these boots come into their own. Because they're super good. Ta-da! <laughs> Corner kill! 361! This is perhaps the nicest weather I've ever been up here in. Look at this! With just far-reaching views of Loch Lomond. Largest freshwater lake in the Great Britain, or in Great Britain, by surface area. 22, 23 miles long. Beast. <laughs> Actually, 
It felt like a bit of a sacred moment as I stood alone atop Conic Hill. There was so much beauty to take in. Ancient mountains, still waters, and a magical mist that framed the image. This was a landscape steeped in history, and here I was, drawn back to its story once again. My entire being finely tuned to hear whatever it had to say. It was in moments like these that I felt utterly content and totally free. Here we go, look, if I had to drop into the woods just above Balmaha, and this is where the camping management zone begins. From March to September, camping is only permitted in campsites and permit areas. See how this tree has been smoothed by people walking on it. I'm so tempted to slide down that, but these knolls look very, very uncomfortable. At the bottom of the descent was Baumaha, an idyllic place that was home to the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park Centre. Well worth a visit if you've got a spare moment. There were also a couple of cafes, which naturally was where I ended up. I'm having the best time right now. So I'm at St Mocha in Balmaha. I've just had a coffee. I also had a toasty because I thought, well, why not? And I've just gone to the shop and picked up some socks. These are nice and thin, so and cushioned in the right places. So let's just see if they help my feet. I'll put them on. And then I also got this little Highland cow because it's really cute. Um, why not? So, you know, just me and my cow, really, on the way. Uh, my name's Jotty. I'm from Aberdeen. Uh, I moved to Aberdeen last year after I finished the way for the first time. Uh, so I'm originally from Lincolnshire. Um, and I decided to walk the way this time because I just got back from a humanitarian mission in Ukraine. Um, and it was a bit stressful, it was a couple of weeks and I've got some time off before I start my next job. So I thought, I hit the way again, solo this time. Uh, I've got a new pack and some new gear that I wanted to try out. So it's a familiar route. And that's why I decided to do it this week. For me, it's like a big reset button as well. When life gets stressful, you just go on one big hike and you just feel so much, I mean, it, it beats you up, but you feel so much more refreshed afterwards at the yep. same time. <laughs> just start small, try and find, there's many groups as well if you don't want to hike alone um, and just do it now. Unlike other works, I think the West Highland Way just gets better every single day. So the first day is nice and smooth and easy and you get in the rhythm of it. Then you see Loch Lomond, then you get into Glencoe. It just gets better and better and better every day. New socks feel amazing. I'm going to be like a mountain goat, hopefully. So I've attached the uh, cow to my shoulder strap and he's going to be my lucky mascot and come hiking with me. Look after yourself, yeah? You too. Happy hiking, coffee, toasty, and my little pal. Let's get cracking. Just down the road was Tom Weir's garden. Tom being a broadcaster, environmentalist, and climber who lived locally. He died in 2006, and in 2014, a statue was unveiled in the gardens to commemorate the role he played in inspiring folks to get outside. From the statue, I passed by a lovely viewpoint looking out over the bay, and then set off along the shores of Loch Lomond. I always love the look of this house, and they always keep their windowsill flowers very, very nice.
name of the visitor centers here. Run and jump. Hey, watch your ankles. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> this is how I do it. <laughs> you basically flew there, dude. <laughs> This uh, stretch, first stretch along Loch Lomond here on the way is interesting um, in a sense that we're always alongside the road, could just follow that if I wanted to. And then a path undulates this way and that, up and down through sort of beech and silver birch forests like this, they're native. And this whole region is being restored for environmental reasons, for nature. And speaking of nature, the birds are singing and no doubt there's plenty of red squirrels keeping an eye on me as I make progress along the way. Nearby was the Cashel Native Forest Reserve, a restoration project aiming to recreate 3,000 acres of native woodland. As a testimony to their work, the land through which I was traveling felt vibrant and healthy, with bilberry bushes, lichen, wood sorrel, and other plants guiding me on. There were several campsites too, offering a great opportunity to break this leg up, should you need to do so. Hi Abby, I'm Andrew and I'm from Carlisle, just uh, south of the Scottish border. And I just thought uh, I'd give the West Highland Way a go. It's, um, it's got a taste of everything. You've got the, you start off in the sort of Scottish lowlands, the uh, Milgai, and then you kind of walk through past the Campsies and uh, up into the Highlands. It's just, uh, you get a flavour of everything really. I just like the, 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 the solitude and the, the time for sort of enjoying nature and, and reflection, listening to the birds. Try and go for maybe a weekend or an overnighter. Um, you don't have to buy really expensive gear um, and, and just keep your kind of um, ambitions quite small to begin with until you find your feet. Um, and then the world's your oyster, I reckon. So this fungi here behind me is a uh, horseshoe fungi. So basically, this is interesting. Why well, I find it interesting? Because essentially our ancestors would have hacked this off and got a spark in it. And that's how they would transport fire when they were traveling because it holds a spark and it just gently smolders away. And then what you can do is you can take that, you can put it in tinder, blow into it and start a fire in a very traditional way. So uh, we're gonna leave it here because we don't need a fire, but always good to stumble upon it. Chuck is a rope. Is that the end? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good little climb actually. Trigger up land. Let's just keep going. Nice small steps, keeping yourself upright. Get the job done. It's really cool actually. A lot of leapfrogging going on. I stop, people catch up. They stop, I catch up. All the good banter and conversations. And I feel like it's really changing my perspective a bit on hiking. And speaking of change, what we've got here is the University of Glasgow. They've got a station here, which essentially is for environmental research. So, oh, they built more buildings. Um, <laughs> they're monitoring the lake and all sorts of different things to help track how everything's changing, I guess, essentially, in the wake of climate change. Just above the tree line um, is Ben Lomond, shrouded in cloud right now, but we're gonna go to the base of it and see the path where you can go up. Again, you know, just saying, another video, check it out on the channel, Ben Lomond. It's an interesting one. At various points, the way would pop out from the trees to reveal awesome views across the loch. And sometimes, much to our surprise, we learned that it was raining, having been sheltered by the canopy thus far. 
The experience felt truly wholesome, and it was amazing to be so exposed to the elements, hour by hour. Absolutely beautiful flowers. Probably one of my favourites ever. Another little waterway. There it is! <laughs> the pub! <laughs> the pub! <laughs> the pub! <laughs> We're nearly there! <laughs> you can smell it. What does the pub smell like? Shit. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Well, we made it to Rwandan Hotel. It says on the top, 1696. This is an old building. We're heading to the Klansman Bar to get a drink. <sighs> Look at these guys off. All of it. All about the salt. That's quite a lot of salt. <laughs> if you thought of it. I'm slow. <laughs> Righty. Pain is real putting those boots back on, but it's nice to get outside actually. Ben Lomond looming above us and Loch Lomond ahead. I'm gonna see how far I get. It's four, well, it's gone past four now. Um, I'm just gonna take this steady, I think. It's really hard also to know sort of what to tell you about this stretch of the trail because pretty much for everybody, it's a slog. It's a, uh, you know, bit of road, bit of forest, lots of forest. At least it's a level path a little bit. Later on, on the shores of Loch Lomond, it gets a bit more undulating, rocky, rooty, slippy. Um, again, it's not bad, but it's just pff, draining. Regardless of the pain and waning energy levels, the miles weren't going to walk themselves. The next point of interest was Ben Lomond, Scotland's most southerly Munro, and one that's well worth the climb if you have an extra day plus the energy required to climb to all 974 metres above sea level. Hats off to you if you do nip up though, as it's quite an effort with a heavy backpack. There have actually been a number of uh, water stations along the way, and again, it's another perk of the West Island Way, just the availability of amenities. So there's these blue things, which are basically potable water, so you just fill up your bottles. And if you think about where we actually are, just in the middle of nowhere, sort of, in the highlands, obviously, yes, it's catered for, for hikers and tourism, but it's just a really cool system because, again, it just stops people buying plastic bottles at the villages and then possibly just throwing them away or dropping them. Like, we've all got our refillable bottles. And you know what? If they can do it out here, why can't they do it in cities? Why can't they do it in places where there's loads of people? Big question mark. Probably your answer is money. <laughs> I considered sleeping in here last time. What, in the toilet? Just in that, that little bit. It was so rainy and I was so tired. <laughs> it's worth noting that we were now within the Ben Lomond National Memorial Park, established in 1997 as a way to remember those who fought for the country. It's also yet another example of native woodland restoration a 40-year project seeking to bring the lands back to life. Oh, look at this. Look at the spot of heaven. Beautiful. And a race fire, even better. Hey, guys. Hi. Look snug. <laughs> wow. So, fizzy drinks. What's in there? Cheese ruse. Does anyone know what that is? Rolls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Muffin. Banana loaf. That's quite tempting. Italian cookies just had to. Oh, big. Wow. That is the biggest, fanciest. That's definitely had an upgrade since I was here in 2012. Clearly, <laughs> business is booming. <laughs> Alright, people, we have a significant moment. This is Tarmigan Lodge. So, this is the point where the camping management ends. Secondly, one can pitch up anywhere on the other side of the sign, which we just have to find. So here, you can't camp. And fast forward. <laughs> here, you can. So this is a junction point. This has definitely become more significant, I think, since I last walked the trail. But essentially, you can walk a low route along the shores of Loch Lomond, 
or you can head up here and essentially stay on this track for a fair bit. So for me, as I mentioned, I'm on a bit of a personal journey and just retreading the original route that I walked. So naturally I'm going to say hi um, and just continue on to the body and see where we go from there. Lots of different water features, just tumbling down from Ben Lomond and the surrounding mountains. I don't know if you can see that, but this puddle is full of tadpoles. All of them swimming around, just tadpoling around. I think I've made my decision that I am going to stop at the body, not actually at the body, but camp around it. Um, I can't deny how tired I'm feeling, actually. Six o'clock, quarter past six. It's not the worst time to be pitching up really and that gives me a solid 12 hours in the tent. Epically at, what time is it? Um, half past six, we've made it to the junction to get to the body. Um, I feel a bit like I'm cutting myself short here. Like I know I could keep going, but like you say, I'm on this journey to try and not beat myself up. It's not a flipping army now. So I'm going down here. Look after yourself, mate. You too. See you later. See you later. Bye. Half past six. Am I cutting myself short? Or should I keep going? Ugh, oh, the questions. Why do we do this to ourselves? What is this about? This is why I'm here. Welcome to my personal journey. Several goats in this area. Trail descends to Loch Shore near Caelaness. See how dense this forest gets though? Like, that's what I'm going to be in. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm tapping into my steps. What I've learned is when I struggle with something <clears throat> because of mental wobbles, to have steps. So if in doubt, check it out and then we'll decide from there. I see this is the turning. Let's go see if anyone else is here. As a side note to my mild internal drama, the body is a really nice stop off for the night. It often gets busy during peak season but it's a wonderful place to experience your first sleep in a body if you choose to do so. What do you think? That is a very, very nice campsite. Obviously a few people have. Someone's had a fire. Don't think I'm gonna do that, but there we go. And then I just ping, ping, ping down to the lock and I can see the view. Okay, step one is to get rid of all the pine cones because they ain't gonna be comfortable to sleep on. People, disaster has struck. I've lost my coup and I don't know where he is. So I have to go back along the path. It's very important to me. Stay tent. He's definitely not here. Oh, I've got to get some sugar in me as well in the process. Where's that weapon? Oh, how did that happen? I can't believe I lost my coup. I'm devastated. It has a very special coup. <coughs> coup definitely could be quite a long way back and anybody could have picked him up, but I really want to find him. I can't believe I'm running my feet are so absolutely shredded. This is how important coup is to me. Coup is for my girlfriend. Nothing stops me doing things for my girlfriend. All right, junction. Koo is not at the junction. No koo. No koo at the junction, okay. That is not koo, that is a rock. I don't want a rock. I want koo. Down the hill. Oh, come on koo. Where are you? I see a koo. Oh. I'm sorry, Koo. I didn't mean to drop you. Oh, that's proper relief. Also, that means I was the slowest walker, but that's fine. Koo, I'm sorry. And you have a bug on you. <laughs> Maybe that's the trigger for my emotional release. <laughs> 
I found Koo. The world is good. Uh, why is this so such a big deal? Because love is a big deal. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> and this was given to me by a very nice shop man. And I want to pass on the kindness and the love. <laughs> I just ran a mile and a half. <laughs> I have to walk back now. <sighs> Hello, Loch Lomond. How are you? You're looking pretty spectacular this evening. <laughs> and I gotta wash my feet in you. Oh, James, that is freezing. Why do people swim in this? Okay, I'm clean. That's great. Thank you very much, hygiene. You served me well. Ah, oh. ow. just because he's become a bit of an icon on the trip. Ku is sitting in the back this time. He's going to have backwards views, but he is not going to fall out. Stay Ku. Good Ku. Let's go past the body and refine the trail. Look, climb in there and just stretch him on as far as the eye can see. Beautiful. Last night went really well. Uh, there was one point where I woke up and put my earphones in because my head was like, ooh. And I don't listen to anything when I put my headphones in. I just block out the sounds. <laughs> uh, and that, that helped. I didn't get too agitated. And otherwise, I was out, quite frankly. Um, it was a really light night. So I could see out the whole time, which was quite nice. Um, and I just kept, kept my eyes open every so often. So yeah. Um, Good night, oops, and I'm very pleased with that as a wild camping experience because I did it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's helpful having these tools, if in doubt, scout it out, and uh, I don't know, you just gotta trust yourself, just gotta believe in it, and look, use your eyes, it really helps me. Ah, uh, look at this, <laughs> beautiful steps all the way up over this reassuringly high bridge. And it wobbles actually quite a lot. <laughs> so really, it's here that the shores of Loch Lomond and the path that we're following start to get a bit more undulating. As you probably noticed as soon as we left the body behind, the track became a path, and the path has become this rocky, rooty trail that we're following. And from in the snade, it gets even more gnarly. Just gotta reject the temptation to vomit and actually enjoy it for what it is. You know, it feels a bit wilder than much of the route along the shores of the Bonnie Loch Lomond. Look at this one. That's cool. And through the trees, a couple hours later, emerges in the snade. Perhaps one of the more dramatic falls on the way. In 
Silversnade is a tiny little place, made up mainly of a grand hotel and a small pier where a seasonal ferry docks from time to time. There is an official wild camping spot just on along the trail after the hotel, next to a sign detailing the various conservation strategies undertaken by RSPB Scotland in the area. There you go, yes, this is fun. We built up a tight squeeze. Should be fine though. Keyword it should be. Do, 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 do. Ah! Ah! <laughs> this is perhaps one of my favourite spots along the side of the lock. If I turn around. Look at this, we've got our first opening views down towards the head of the lock with a little island in the middle and the big domineering mountains on the horizon. There's actually some patches of snow about as well. I mean, you could look at it and feel intimidated because there's a long way to go, but it's also really exciting because that, well, that's the journey that we're on. We get to walk all of it right into the heart of the mountains and that's where we're going next. For the first time in my three hikes along the shore, I was actually enjoying the trek along Loch Lomond. It felt mysterious and forgotten, with gnarly trees protruding from mossy boulders. Although at one point the eeriness got a little bit too real when I stumbled upon an abandoned tent. That tent has been abandoned from the looks of it. That's not okay. got to really watch your footing. These rocks are reasonably slippy and this is definitely where having boots makes a difference. See that this this is an interesting spot. You've one foot there, hand there for support, we're gonna whip round and now we're on this nice little ledge and then quite frankly we'll let ourselves down. We're sort of tucked away from the lock which is somewhere over there and it's uh, amazing because I actually think that's the worst of the undulation underfoot done now. That flew by. I really enjoyed that. I mean, I had to stop at Inversnade and uh, maybe that just gave me a bit of an extra wind. I did not find that challenging at all. And that oh, is a good feeling. <laughs> Ooh, it's a beautiful day so far. Here we go then people, we've reached the body, you can see the head of Loch Lomond just about and where our path starts to tuck away and head on into the highlands. This for me is a real transition point on the way and it feels so good to be here. Morning! Oh, you guys are the wise ones keeping the fire going. <laughs> yes, I don't believe it. We found the goats, the feral goats that roam the hillsides here. I wasn't sure if we'd see them or not. I just spotted one through the trees. The massive horns. Oh, here we go, look. Ard Louis Ferry. Hotel, shop, camping, showers and laundry. So Ard Louis is actually on the western shore on the road. So for some people, they choose to stop there and uh, one basically has to get across the edge of the lock. You know, for me, this is one of the most rewarding moments along the way. You know, you actually get the opportunity to look back and see how far 
you've walked all the way from Balmahar and Conic Hill along the eastern shore of Loch Lomond. 20 something miles of ups and downs and rocks and roots, it's gnarly. And we've covered that on our own two feet. It's incredible. And to just look back and see that, the rugged hills and the waterfalls and the inlets and bays and the islands, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's magical, quite frankly. First cuckoo of the season, 20th of April. Oh, shut up now. <laughs> In the Scottish Highlands, put it there. Yes. And it's gone. <laughs> and it's gone, it'll be back. Oh man, that is the best feeling. A short while on and we reached Being Glass campsite. An epic place to resupply, rest and enjoy good food. And that indeed was our plan. Well, I'm on my way. I've never eaten so much food on a hike, <laughs> but I'm loving the pace, I'm loving the company. I'm leaving the campsite now, and I'm heading into Glen Falloch, the first glen along the way. Now, we have got the noise of the big A road next to us, but that aside, this is a very interesting walk because I'm on a military road built by General Wade and his army, the British army, in the 18th century to control the Jacobite rising. There's a lot of history along this next leg and I can't wait to share it with you. There it is, River Falloch, looking amazing this afternoon. Wow. Just crazy, the power of water has etched its way through these rocks. Wow. We're into the big open space now, leaving those willow things behind. And you can see we've got the road, the railway, and now the pylons all the way through the glen. To be honest, the roar of the road was really intrusive and the pylons felt out of place as well. And yet, the walking was pleasant enough, and navigation pretty much as easy as it gets. Dropped right down to part of the river now, which is super cool. And even better, is we get to cross over. Oh, that's a stiff one. <laughs> Here's the beautiful gorge. River running strong and fast all the way down. One of the things I love about water features and rivers in particular is they are long lasting things, structures almost of nature. In a sense that the path I'm walking now, obviously yes, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of hikers have walked this trail, but that river was the same river during the time of the Jacobite Rebellion, when the British were up here building their rows and the military were yomping through, when Highlanders were droving their cattle between the major market towns. We are literally walking in the footsteps of history. And that is what excites me so much about this leg of the trail. Now, I'm no historian, but to jump back to basics for a wee moment. The purpose of these rows was to suppress and exert control over the local population by the British army. Jacobitism was a political movement attempting to overthrow the rule of the House of Hanover and restore the House of Stuart to the British throne. The movement was particularly strong in Scotland, where the support was primarily dynastic, and in the years making up the 17th and 18th centuries, there were many bloody battles that scarred the lands 
through which I was now peacefully walking. Found Max again. Hello. <laughs> um, and it's really just, well, about time to head under the road. Uh, and no, it's just interesting because the winds are blowing some drizzle down from the peaks. So first bit of precipitation really on the way. So this is the road crossing, nice human sized tunnel. So now we're on the other side. The road is down there. As you can see, we're walking into the weather, but it is the Highlands after all. And there's also seems to be some kind of truck work going on. I don't know what that is, but it's pretty shredded up. Well, this forest signifies a change heading through the Deerproof Gate. And this is the junction point. So that path there heads down to Crinlari, and the West Highland Way continues up into the forest. Whew. And we're parting ways now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, mate. That no, has been good. Thanks <laughs> nah, for the company. Yeah. Yeah, cool. no worries. You too, as well. And let me know how you did. Yeah, definitely. Cool. You too as well. Will do, man. See ya. Bye. Oh, man. It is sad. It's like, you know, I love the space and all that. But it's the people. I can't believe I'm getting hung up on people. I like nature and animals. <laughs> but there we go, isn't it? We are a part of nature. We are wild. And we do need each other. And Max has been great company since the beginning. And now it's just me in the way. This is probably exactly the way it's meant to be. <sighs> Let's do it. So now it's into the forest. Crinolaric forest. Mixture of dense pine and open spacious pine. So I think if I'm right, the road goes kind of around that way. And over there somewhere is Ben Moore, highest mountain in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. Possibly that one up there. Not that you can see it, but if you were in that blue sky, maybe you could. <laughs> you can see behind me this is a uh, forestry work so all of these generally sitka spruce which are the pine ones that are or pine trees that are really closely compacted they are actually timber they're harvested for timber they're a crop left to grow for sort of 15 to 20 years and then they're harvested just like this and you get massive stacks of them and it looks so destructive when the trucks are coming up here and they can fell up to 100 trees in just a couple of minutes it's mad but that is the modern harvesting system. And then very often the hillsides are left desolate and barren, completely decimated. And it's like a bomb has gone off, you know, but slowly, slowly the stumps that are left, the dead wood that are left can attract uh, sort of new species and pioneering species from lichens and mosses, the insects breaking things down and helping to put the nutrients back into the soil. Then you get the native species coming in so rowan and ash and oak and beech and birch and whatever it is and quite often the forestry commission do uh plant saplings so we'll see what this space is going to be like but the thing with trees unlike modern technology is uh quick to chop down very slow to grow but you know what i think trees need more appreciation because without them we wouldn't be here would we Camp down there. Looks good. Hiya! Underneath the viaduct. Here we are. Ooh. Ooh. Yes! The 882! 
<laughs> that was quiet for once. And here's the river. Oh, and there's a big train up there. This was the River Philan, a long river system that acts as home to many wild fish species. In fact, the entire area around Kirkton is protected and managed for the benefit of environmental conservation and historical reasons too. Just up the trail was the St Philan Priory. Well, the remains, at least. St Philan was an Irish evangelist who came to Scotland to convert the Picts and the Scots to Christianity in the 7th century. Just opposite, on the other side of the track, was the Kirkton Burial Ground, home to four early medieval cross slabs dating to the 7th and 8th century. There was simply so much to see in this area. Leaving the Priory behind now, and we're really on to sort of the final leg for my day at least, to just before Tindrum. So Tindrum is a real sort of hubbub of uh, on the trail. Obviously it's past halfway, but it's a good stock up point. There's the green welly, which supplies things for hikers. Um, and yeah, just starting to feel a bit tired, but I think it's because I'm dehydrated. Definitely not drunk enough and I was lazy and didn't filter water back then when I should have done. So there's a campsite up here. I'm gonna see if there's anywhere I can just fill my bottles and um, probably from there, I'll push on for another 20 minutes or so. I know where I wanna try and get to, but we'll see. Here we go, Tendrum, one and a half miles. Nearly there. <laughs> it's good to do full days on the trail, you know. Good to do full days on the trail. Days on the trail, I don't even know anymore. My brain is not working. Here we are in Tendrum Community Woodland. Nice little information board about the wildlife. Tiny little distance on and we've got the Battle of Dalrig here. So, Clan MacDougall and Robert the Bruce were allies during the Wars of Independence in 1296. And this basically goes on to tell about the story of the battle which took place just here. Which is just bonkers, isn't it, really? That, again, like, the land remains the same. Nature is steadfast. Sure, it's been, you know, sculpted and shaped and used for different reasons. And I want to say we're in peaceful times, but no, we're not. Um, still. Fascinating. Equally as curious was a big stone slab with a sword on it, said to replicate the sword thrown into a nearby lochan by Robert the Bruce. Now I've been to a fair few lochans where he supposedly deposited his sword. My question is, how many swords did he have? So these lands around Hindrum, which have become a community forest now, are actually all part of the old lead mining stations. That's why it's quite flat, but also with little undulations and the river's quite sporadically spread out because this is a very man-used region. Um, obviously lead is not mined here anymore, but it had a huge part of the history of the area and uh, essentially is why many of the settlements are what we see today. So rather typically it's decided it wants to rain, um, enough that I'm actually getting down and probably should act on it. But I'm going to give myself five minutes and just see if I can find somewhere for the tent. The trouble is it's very very wet and also very tussocky. Um, head that's not a problem, tussocks on the other hand are quite lumpy. <laughs> Hiya! Oh, you are super cute! Are you a bit soggy? Yeah, a bit soggy. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. So just wave goodbye to this lovely couple from Portsmouth. Um, they're staying in Tindrum and I don't feel like I've played this card very well. It's so tussocky and wet, um, or it's just exposed. For example here, this is uh, all part of the old lead mine and that's just daft, I'm not doing that. So. It doesn't sit right with me, but I think I've just got to do it because I don't want to upset anybody, but I'm just going to go to the campsite today. Um, 
which is funny because I literally just carried nearly three litres of water because I didn't think I'd be able to get any because obviously with this being lead I wasn't sure about the the river so much for wild camping but this is it this is the journey this is where you just have to embrace it you know whatever it brings you and adapt and overcome so campsite it is hopefully I can just find a nice tight quiet spot and literally it's seven o'clock pretty much is it seven o'clock so it's quarter past seven like 12 hours ago I left camp so I just want to rest now <laughs> oh look drying room not that that matters 500 meters see like in there looks flatter but it's soaking wet <laughs> it's actually boggy <sighs> why why does boggy exist Okay, scrap all of that, I feel happy. I'm in Tindrum. I've just walked all that way today, that is bonkers. I don't care if I'm camping here. Yeah? Um, ah, just chuffed. And Tindrum is a cool place, so I'm just gonna make the most of this. Means I don't have so far to walk tomorrow morning to get coffee. Yes. Hiya. How are you? How are you taking weary hikers? Day four on the West Island Way. Let's go get coffee. Nothing else needs to be said right now. At first glance, Tindrum can seem like carnage. A busy road with lots of people, and it certainly can be chaotic. But for passing hikers, is a little bit of a godsend, with several cafes and the Green Welly stop to stock up on supplies. Leaving Tindrum now then. So I got some supplies, I got a coffee, and it's drizzly raininess. So it's hard to know whether horseproofs are needed or not. But heading out now along a military road, which is gonna take us all the way to the Bridge of Orkey. I love this stretch. I'm a bit gutted that the cloud's down because it is absolutely stunning, but still, make the best of it and just enjoy the walking. Heading out of town, the route crossed over the railway line and practically vibrated with the noise of the A82. Thankfully though, we wouldn't stay close for too long. And soon enough, sheep were now my companions, rather than cars. Generally, much softer and altogether friendlier, I have to say. So this is it. We begin our seven mile march to the bridge of Orkney, once again, treading down through history. Now, I have a few markers for the day. My ultimate goal is King's House. That makes this a 20 mile day, including a 10 mile stretch across Rannock Moor, the last remaining expanse of wilderness in the UK. Now, before I get there, I've got a few markers. First is Bridge of Orkney, then over the top to Invernan. And from there, I'm gonna have a reassess see where we're up to, see what the weather's doing, and then it's on to Rannochmore, if that's what feels right. Fairly sure I will, just trying to get my right foot warmed up. It is quite sore today, but you know, is what it is. <laughs> just gotta keep walking. That's kind of the nature of this hiking thing. Off into the hills I went, now leaving the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, a monumental boundary that I could see marked on the side of the road. I waved my cheery goodbyes and then yomped on along the way. These tiny little tunnels are so cool.
Ah, uh, that's always good to see. Urban Mountain Rescue Team, just a wee donation for. And then we're crossing over this beautiful bridge. Hi. Google's cottage of all the daffodils. Pretty nice, eh? Well, I can see the Bridge of Orkey. That's our first seven miles almost done. 13 to go, but we'll come to that. <laughs> so the Bridge of Orkey is actually, I find, quite a nice place. It's tiny, <laughs> and as the name sort of infers, there is a bridge. and. Uh, I think it's about time we took a closer look. Let's get there and investigate. Not that way. <laughs> Physics. The Bridge of Orkey is home to a station on the West Highland Line, on which I have seen trains coming and going over the days past. There was also a community hall, a fire station, and the Bridge of Orkey Hotel. And the highlight of it all, the Bridge of Orkey itself. And for me, this is one of the best views along the trail. The bridge was yet another construction related to the pacification of the clans in the 18th century. It proved to be yet another reminder for gratitude of the freedom I was enjoying in that moment. And then just over the other side, this is where I camped last time. With my wee tent, you're officially allowed to camp here, just next to the bridge itself. So cool. All right, we have left the Bridge of Orkey. I'm feeling the pain, so I got the earphones in. Let's get some good vibes on and let's enjoy the scenery. Here we go, heading out of the tree line. Gonna be a wee bit breezy. There's Loch Tula. I can actually see it this time, that's nice. <laughs> that is rather spectacular. Wow, look at that view ahead. This is getting real now, people. people walk the West Harlem way. When you can see where you're going, it is really hard to beat. Hiya. Hiya. All right. Yeah, yeah, good you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Well, I'm buzzing. We've made it down to the head of Loch Tula, and this is Inverowen. Many hikers choose to stop here for the day. Um, for me, it's just gone one o'clock, halfway point of my day. Um, so I'm gonna fill up some water and then just basically keep cracking. Also, I feel like I just need eyes everywhere because there's so much to see. The Inverowen Hotel was built in 1708 and sits on the western end of Loch Tula. It makes for a great coffee stop on the way, or for me, a chance to refill my water bottles. Oh, this is it. Water bottles filled up. 
I shoved some dehydrated apple down my mouth and now I'm heading to the beginning of Rannoch Moor. Short stretch along the road and then it begins. A hundred metres on sits an official wild camping spot on the edge of the river. It makes for a lovely night's pitch if you want to stop before reaching Rannoch Moor, which, in all fairness, does feel like a rather eerie place to be alone at night. Just heading over Victoria Bridge. You can see as well on the surrounding peaks there's a fair bit of snow about. Still a spring thaw going on. From here, it was on past Forest Lodge and then out onto the moors. There we go. West Harlem Way, Bosch, Drove Road to Glencoe. This is where it begins, people. So this is it. The thing we've been talking about for all this time, the road across Rannoch Moor. And for me, this is a very exciting one, being a drover's road, because I love Scottish drover's roads. You know, I can almost hear the clamour and chaos of hundreds of cattle being driven by their men who are yearning for the next inn, the next bit of banter and company in a warm bed. The energy, the atmosphere is electric if you just allow your mind to wander. And that's exactly what I'm going to do as I cross this great expanse of wilderness. Rannoch Moor is a fascinating place, overshadowed by epic peaks and summits. It's a land notable for its wildlife, and of course, its peat. Now to the unknowing eye, the place seems like a giant bog, but this soggy land plays a major role as a carbon store, meaning the carbon is in the ground rather than in the atmosphere, acting to protect the future stability of our climate. To be honest, the place feels vast and wild and desolate, and yet it had a real character about it that simply made my jaw drop. Left the tree line now, and this is what I've never seen before. The last two times it was mist, mist, mist. Now it's a wide open expanse. The beauty of the place was outstanding, and the miles passed quickly. Ancient lands, stoic and unchanging. I could feel them watching on as I passed through. I mean, I so often find landscapes or find myself in places that just bring me to my knees, sometimes literally, usually get bruised. <laughs> just with the pure, raw beauty. And right now I'm actually in quite a lot of pain. Uh, my, my feet hurt, <laughs> my back hurts, but I'm just grinning from ear to ear the entire time because this is good pain, especially in my legs. And my back is something slightly different, but my legs is like, this is what we're supposed to feel, physical, <laughs> exertion. We are meant to move. We are born and built to spend time in places like this. This should be home for us. This is home for us. We are not separate from nature but we are a part of it and it is such a grounding, healthy, humbling experience to get to places like this. We need this. We need nature. We need to be reminded of how small and insignificant we are and yet at the same time we have the capacity to create meaningful change across the globe through our words and through our actions. And the pain in my legs right now and in my feet feels good. I'm built to do this. When I'm at home and I'm in pain and I'm doing nothing, that is chronic pain. It, it's such a deep, depressing suffering. I'd take this pain any day of the week because this is the reward. <laughs> I just feel, I feel amazing, you know? And I don't ever want to stop hiking. I don't ever want to stop pushing myself to my limits. 
I don't ever want to stop coming to places like this. If the pain in my back, my chronic pain, my injury, my brain damage, whatever the doctors want to call it, because they don't know what it is, whatever it is, is not going to defeat me. It's not going to beat me and it is not going to stop me from being strong enough and courageous enough to find myself in places like this by the power of my own body and my own will. That is my declaration right now. That is my fight back. And this is my brave. Well folks, we've come over the top and we've left Rannoch Moor behind and this is Glen Coe, one of the greatest icons of the Scottish Highlands and the home of Scottish mountaineering, all overshadowed by that great bulk of a mountain, that is the great herdsman of Ateve. Now this glen has seen so much history from massacres and battles to humble herdsmen plodding through with their cows. And right in the bottom is the King's House Hotel. Now it's had a huge renovation in recent years. It's massive and it's certainly not the tranquil little place that it was back in the days. I first went there in 2012 on my first long distance hike that oh, just so happened to be the West Island Way. And I'm heading there again today in 2022, hopefully for a bowl of chips. Passing the ski centre, the path waved to the famous Black Rock Cottages before promptly crossing the busy A82 for a final leg to King's House. Right, gotta try and somehow get across here. This guy doesn't know what side of the road to drive on. It's quite a wide road. <laughs> Made it! Yeah! My face aches from smiling so much. <laughs> Whoa, I haven't seen this thing completed yet. That is mad. It's like being in the Alps or something. <laughs> Jeez. Here we are, so you can see all of these guys have decided to pitch up a bit more over there. A couple down here, everyone's just chilling. See, that's what it used to look like. Now look what they made. That. <laughs> never mind, I have to find somewhere before I collapse properly and never move again. <laughs> Here's the bridge. It's actually quite wet underfoot. Oh, <laughs> squidgy, squidgy. Uh, let's go over this way. I'm getting further and further into this place. I've got to make sure I can get out. But thankfully I have a good navigational tool. That thing. <laughs> oh, I can squeeze in somewhere here, can't I? This'll do. Just looks like I'm in the absolute wilderness and then you turn around to the other side and it's like, ah, no. <laughs> but anyway, that uh, no is actually proving very kind for me because I'm going to go get some grub. So food, teeth, bed. I'll see you guys in the morning, ready for day five, can I always admit day, on the West Highland Way. Bonkers, absolutely bonkers.
Ugh, morning people. That was a long night. I don't know if I have mild food poisoning. <laughs> I don't know if I just really overexerted myself. I don't know if I was dehydrated badly. Or I don't know if my tick bite on the back of my leg, the one that I'm concerned about, is actually getting to me. But I did not feel good last night and I still don't feel great. The food was not staying down. Um, I had to keep putting my head out the window, the door, whatever, to try and be sick, but I wasn't actually sick in the end, and my tummy is just rock solid in bloat, and I just could not sleep. Um, my head sometimes just gets stuck in a loop and 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 a loop, and it's torture. Coffee bag and coconut milk. Alrighty, tent is down. That sounded more energetic than I feel. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That's the enthusiasm you're gonna get. It's half past 10, which actually I'm quite pleased with because I wasn't convinced I was gonna get up before 12. Let's get to Kinloch leaving. My tummy is so painful. <laughs> The route headed deeper into Galenco, following the A82 for the first few miles. At this point, I didn't mind the traffic noise, as the landscape around me was incredible enough to drown out all of the discomfort of the walk. As a big like metaphor I use in my life in general, it's so easy to walk along looking at our feet, looking at our phones, but actually to look up is where change can happen is where inspiration can start and if I look up this is what I get I mean it's a no-brainer really right <laughs> yes there's the A8 too but this landscape it's very dramatic with skies like this when the clouds are hanging quite low just trying to breathe it all in the majesty and awe of the Glen was insane and it was easy to see why it's famous the world around Well, much to my relief, this is where we leave the A82 because I've just seen some pretty poor driving. <laughs> um, but the Devil's Staircase lies ahead of us. I'm excited to get this thing done, actually. Big tick in the box once we reach the top. The Devil's Staircase, in my opinion, sounds so much worse than it actually is. The route ascends 259 metres and was named by the soldiers who had to carve a road up the bleak hillside in the 1750s. Nowadays, there's a good, clear path, and it makes for steady walking. It's actually a really lovely ascent, just uh, alongside this bubbling brook here. Just trying to take it really steady and breathe. Definitely, as I say, warm. Could change my hat. Can't be bothered to stop. <laughs> we'll do that at the top. It's just really funny looking up and seeing the array of waterproof backpack covers. Everybody heading in one direction, the top. It's pretty distressing. There's a missing dog and like, everyone on the hillside is looking. <laughs> Oh. oh my god, thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh your mummy and daddy are so here. Oh, it makes me emotional. <laughs> oh, great, get on. 
Jeez. Those are literally like my worst nightmare, losing my dog. Happy days. Now everyone can keep going. <laughs> exactly. Just like that, half an hour or so later, the top five, four, eight meters above sea level. Whew. Put my hat on and take in that view. Right, double staircase, let's get down to Kinloch Leven and then up the other side and find camp. That is the beauty of a shorter day today. In the meantime, this is actually quite a long descent. So I'm just going to psych it in. And what's really cool with the cloud lifting is we'll be able to see across to the Mamors, which is another range of mountains here in Scotland. And tomorrow we'll be able to see the big boy. Yep, Ben Nevis. So that's tomorrow. Let's get today done. <laughs> Uh, this is the point where you can just see the route winding its way across the hillside over there. And again, all the waterproof covers dictating the way. So it's actually Easter Sunday today and I think, you know, that's why I'm really trying to just sit in gratitude because it's a very special day each year, you know. Yes, commercialism has turned it into chocolate and Easter bunnies, but it is more than that, whether you're religious or spiritual or not. And I think no matter what you believe, it's a really nice opportunity just to reflect and look at life and focus on the things that make life the beautiful gift that it is because life's tough <laughs> and we need reminders sometimes to look at the good things around us no matter how big or small and that's certainly going to be my focus now as I wind my way through the mountains and down into Kinloch Leven because I'm certainly walking through a very beautiful place indeed. Hiya! That's a good pitch you got there. <laughs> Whoa, look at this. Stunning. It's not exactly that I've forgotten how spectacular this leg is, but does it's best to take your breath away. <laughs> Wee bridge. So the thing with Kinloch Leven, as we get down there, um, is quite often people call it the ugliest village in the Highlands. Now I think that's a bit unfair because it might be ugly visually, but it's certainly not ugly in terms of, I don't know, human infrastructure. In a sense that it was the first village in the world to have every house powered by electricity. Like that's kind of nuts from somewhere like here. And now we've got all these different hydroelectric schemes going on. There's lots of pipes. It is a bit unsightly, but I don't know. For me, it's sort of the future. <laughs> um, you know, sustainable, renewable energy. So let's see if we can find out a bit more as we get down to the village. In the meantime, I've got to keep walking. It's starting to feel it now. It's a long downhill. <laughs> Old bridge, new bridge. <laughs> Nicknamed the Electric Village, King Lock Leven has a huge amount of history. It formed around the construction of an aluminium smelter, with employee housing making up the bulk of the settlement. 
the processing plant was powered by a hydroelectric scheme, the one I was now walking past. Now to me, just a little bit of knowledge like this can really transform potentially quite a boring hike into something much more interesting and connecting to the story of the landscape. Well, with the long descent behind us, we've reached the bridge crossing over the water pipes. I mean, look at these guys, they're so huge and almost intimidating, actually. We're going to head into the village, and for me, I have a smoothie craving to satisfy, actually. I'm going to give myself an hour here or so, and then press on up the ascent the other side. But then once that's done, it's done, if you know what I'm saying. And then rounding the brow of the hill, we have got the river Leven itself. So this river is very well known for its salmon and its trout. It's a good fish river, as it were. As if to prove a point, here's the little billboard about salmon. We're the salmon. Okay, so I'm just heading off route slightly. Route continues that way, it doesn't come across the bridge just because I want to see if I can uh, get some supplies at co-op. Also, I'm really confused. It looks like there's a deer on the grass. <laughs> Is that actually, there, there's a deer on the grass. Huh? Now, I had no idea, see what I did there, what was actually going on here, but it was super cool to get up close to such a stunning animal. The deer was situated outside of the Ice Factor, home to the biggest indoor climbing ice wall in the world. Not something you see every day, is it? So I'm sat outside the Ice Factor and I'm just trying to make a decision about the day, really. Um, just not improving in how I'm feeling, if anything, just feeling worse. Um, and it's just all I want to do is lie down. And so I'm considering whether to uh, find a campsite and just stay there tonight or whether to carry on up and out of Kinloch even and try and find some way to pitch up. My concern with the campsite is that it's not going to be quiet so I'm not going to be able to sleep. I mean it's the middle of the day now, it's 20 to 4. Whereas if I can just muster up the energy to walk up the hill for half an hour, 40 minutes, probably max an hour, I'll be able to find somewhere and just be by myself but I don't feel like I have the energy at all. So yeah, just gonna give it a bit longer and then try and make a decision, I think. I had a chat with Anna on the phone and she encouraged me to keep going. And then this trooper has caught me up. Look at this, look who it is. Uh, back again. <laughs> back again. I thought she, she lost me, but I caught her up. <laughs> she caught us up. Um, and so we're going to walk together, which is super cool. Just going to give me a bit of a push. So my goal is literally just to get out of the village, up the hill, onto the forestry track and find the first available pitch with a water source. This is the push that I need. Right, let's do it. You've got everything, you're fucking full. Yep. And we go that way, right? right okay. Cool. What's been your favourite part so far then? Um, oh, definitely coming over Ranoch Moor. And, yeah. Uh, it's just just the remoteness of it and the history of that track as well. Yeah. The fact that in the 1930s they were, they were driving cars over there. It's crazy, isn't it's it? It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and, and when you look at the track, you could almost imagine still driving cars over there almost. True. So the campsite was just down there. Oh. And this is where we're headed now. I mean, not sure which way to go. Do you know what, which way it is? Any idea? Ooh. <laughs> it's definitely along here somewhere. Definitely somewhere. <laughs> Maybe let's try this path. I was over the moon to have company along this final leg for the day. And Andrew and I chatted our hearts out as the route climbed ever higher. Other walkers came and went, and there was so much good energy just filling the hillside. I was happy to be hiking once more. Yeah. 
So we're gaining elevation very quickly above Kinloch Leven and looking back we can see over the village. Um, but it's nice sort of climbing through the shrubbery and the trees again, native beech trees in particular. And just making steady progress forward. Definitely feels good to be moving actually. Just needed that extra bit of encouragement. Look at this landscape. It's so worth putting in the effort to get to experience. We're leaving the tree line behind now and we're just surrounded by stoic fells. In this epically massive wild place, I felt vulnerable and small and too in the face of kindness. Everyone I had met this far along the way had offered encouragement and smiles and an unspoken understanding for the task at hand. Walking a trail can be tough at times and it was here on this hillside with another spirited hiker by my side that I realised the power of what we were. We were a community and it felt incredible to know that I belonged. So this is the old sheepfold here. You can see it's uh, pretty derelict. Fascinating place though. And the first time I've been here in the dry. Can I, can I give you a hug? Yeah, of course you cool. can. Yeah. You'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you for your company and support today. Okay. Also, hugging with rip sacks is always hard, isn't it? You're a gem. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, jeez. See, it's the people. It's all about the people. It's uh, just the spirit of the trail. It feels good, actually. But now I'm very ready to find camp. So, a cottage behind and literally walked 100 meters max. I'm going to tuck in here. I mean, it's drier than last night. This will do me just fine. Got the burn coming down. Don't want to be too close because the sound of water sometimes freaks me out in the night. Perfect. Let's get this tent up. I've got my stinky boots off. I've got my stinky socks off. And it's time to settle in for my last night on the trail. I was tempted to do all sorts of filming, I've got reviews to do, yada yada, I'm a bit of a workaholic really, but I don't want to, I just want to be here, in nature, and actually just rest in the gratitude of what I've managed to overcome, not by my own steam so much, but by the power of people and community, you know, there is nothing like the network of connection that you have on the trail you just bond instantly with people you always stop to say hello it's not what do you do in terms of job as a question but where have you come from where are you going where do you live like you know what's brought you here it's so much more like intimate and real it's not superficial but it's very raw and original and it's just one of those things, one of the many things that I love about the hiking community is it's legit. <laughs> and I wouldn't necessarily be here, certainly not in this state, if it weren't for Andrew catching up and buying me this cinnamon roll, which is so cool, and some iron brew, and also just walking with me up here. And then the guys back there who were pitched at the cottage, you know, just just making me laugh every time we walk past like it just it gives you energy it gives you purpose it gives you purpose like we're not built to be isolated and alone most of us want to run away to a desert island at some point but it's not what we're here for you know we need each other i need people as much as the next person and that's just something i've really valued about this experience is yes i am the one who's carried myself a hundred miles almost across the Scottish Highlands you know but it's the spirit of the trail that has kept me going from the raw beauty of nature to the communal energy of the people upon it so once again I do feel changed <laughs> once again I do feel like there's lessons learned once again I do think I've had a reminder that I am stronger than I think but that the strength isn't always my own but it resides in the people around me if only I'm brave enough to let them in.
Good morning. It is raining and it has been raining all night, which has been a very comforting sound in the night. In the morning, it's just a bit like, oh, come on. <laughs> but it is the Wet Highland Way, actually. You know, West Highland Way is its secondary name as far as I'm concerned. We've had very good weather on this trip and uh, I won't complain about one day's worth of rain. So I have just been slowly packing up. I've had some coffee, eaten some food. My stomach is still a massive knot. My favorite position is lying down but we'll see what we can do with the day. Um, it's 11 miles through to Fort William. Hopefully this will ease off a little bit once we get going as well. And uh, we'll be able to see some of the views, but if not, well, we're just getting the true taste of the wet Harlem way. Let's get it done. So in this cramped wee space, I wanted to show you what I sort of do here. Um, so basically I empty here with, of all of the stuff and I put it all away in my rucksack, all whilst I'm still sheltered. I still got my rubbish and stuff. Koo, Koo is still with us. Say hello, Koo. Hello. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then what I'm going to do is check my waterproof on. Hat and stuff all goes here. And then the waterproof cover goes on my rucksack. So then basically everything in there is covered. That then goes outside or depending on how I'm feeling, I sort of, or how heavy the rain is, I shove that there, just in the corner there. I kneel here and I take this inner down. But what I'm gonna do, because this is my last night in my tent, is I'm gonna be a bit lazy. Since I don't have to protect this and stop it getting wet, because I don't need to camp in here tonight, uh, I'm just gonna take it all down in one. So it's gonna be a super quick, easy takedown of camp. Um, and then I just need to filter some water real quick. Uh, so I've got some juice for the day and then we'll get cracking to be honest. <laughs> ah, we made it. Always sounds worse in the tent, doesn't it? Not bad at all. Bye campsite. Highly recommend that spot. Bye cottage. <laughs> Let's go. Let's do it. Last day on the West Harlem Way. Ah, so pumped for this. The air was fresh and the ground more wet than it was dry. But I felt elated with my progress and made sure to soak up the sights and sounds as I pressed on along the glen. I always find it interesting actually how the first part of this walk feels very heavily used like there's a lot of people everywhere and then by the time you sort of hit Rannick Moor and onward there's like less people you know Devil's Staircase gets busy but then no one <laughs> I've never walked this leg and really had much interaction with anybody so this forced time for reflection is probably not the worst idea anyway do a proof gate let's get through this one then <laughs> I don't truthfully even know if the weather's going to hold, but this is worth it. <laughs> worth the risk. Ugh. 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 So you can see now we're sort of rounding the corner and this is where we just drop into some forest intermittently all the way to Glen Nevis. It's funny how when you're in places like this, they can feel really remote and secluded and quite untouched. But obviously around us, we've got the hillside scored with dead trees, stumps just left, the remains of beautiful species just hollow and dark. And up ahead, we've got a billboard which showcases some other information about the historical use or things that took place here. This is certainly not remote and secluded. For the walker travelling north, you've just come through the Larig Moor, the big pass, a route used since the time of cattle drovers. The West Hallam Way at this point skirts by Glen Keechiknish, which has played host for the people for hundreds of years. From warriors who once occupied the small fort on the loch to the clans who grazed their black cattle on the slopes through farming and crofting communities we see today. You are here. You can see West Hallam Way heads up and over. Uh, Dun Deerdale, that's the old hill fort, ancient hill fort, dating back to the Iron Age, and then we loop around to 
to the end of the way, to the sawfoot statue. For the first time in a while, I was actually totally alone on this last push through the hills, with only the sheep for company, some seeming soggier than others after a night of heavy rain. Little bit of climbing, just up to there, <laughs> and we're uh, and we're good. So today being our final day on the trail, we're heading to Glen Nevis. Fort William sits on the end of Glen Nevis, and perhaps the most significant feature within the Glen is Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in Great Britain, one of the three peaks here in the UK. And guess what's just popped out from around the corner? The Ben itself, shrouded in cloud, looking huge and <laughs> domineering there on the horizon. Now many West Highland Waywalkers choose to summit the Ben the day after they finish, but not for me. I've been up there enough times. I'm very happy to admire it from down here and just let it steer me home to the finish of the way in Fort William. It's okay now. Oh, you were so little and wet. Hey baby, hey baby. <laughs> Wow, look at this beauty. See patches of snow actually up there on top of Ben Nevis. Still not quite cleared yet. And here's the hill fort, Dundeerdale Fort. And we're obviously heading down this way, but the hill fort is just up there. And we can see uh, this wee billboard just saying, um, well, the main thing is there was a big fire which burnt it all down. So really, this is the grand finale. So we've got about three and a half, four miles, as a complete guess, all the way down into Fort William through the Nevis Forest. So we're walking along forestry tracks, down to the Braveheart car park, then we pick up the B road and drop into Fort William itself. So this is the ultimate place for reflection and what better place to do it than with the clear Ben right next to us and the views ahead. I mean, this place just has such a good energy because doesn't matter how you're feeling at this point, you're gonna get it done so close now. I was really struggling to comprehend where I was, approaching the end of the way, now for a third time. My head was an explosion of memories from 2012, 2018, and now 2022, of all the things I'd seen, fears overcome, and people I had met along the way. With Fort William appearing from time to time through the trees, all I wanted to do was hold on to the wild around me. The trees, the waterfalls, the mountains, and the big open skies. This was a place that had profoundly shaped me into the person I am today. I feel very calm. I feel like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I've known what I was doing. And I've got through it and it's hurt a lot. It's been really hard, but the practicalities of what I've achieved can never be taken away. It doesn't matter that I've walked trails all around the world. It doesn't matter that, you know, I resupplied or I stopped for coffee. Like, you don't have to beast yourself in order to have that sense of achievement because every journey is different. And, you know, for me in this one, I've just been reminded that I can and that I want to keep going with this despite the ongoing issues with my back and actually that I can deal with all the other aches and pains perfectly fine. Um, yeah, it just, just feels really good. All right then, B road into town. Let's get it done. I 
always wonder why the West Island Way comes along here when you can stay in the track through the forest pretty much all the way to the village but it does so I'm doing it because I want to stick to the way I've come this far Hiya Hello. Hello. Hiya Hiya So we've just reached the main roundabout here on the edge of Fort William and have come across the old ending point for the West Hanna Way. So this is where it used to commence and uh, it's definitely a very random anticlimactic point. So it's really good news that they've got their newer, it's forever going to be new, um, sore feet statue in the middle of town and that's where we're going to go. But first of all, just got to take that in, the official West Harlem Way logo. Do you know I mean? Madness. <laughs> how you are I can already feel the traffic getting under my skin just the frustration of the noise just being relentless constant it's stressful this is why I've tried to escape with this hike the nice thing about Fort William is that the main high street is pedestrianized so eventually I was able to leave some of the noise and chaos and focus on my journey's end. It still felt exceptionally busy though. Gone were the friends and strangers of the trail, replaced by an ambiguity and distance that left me longing to turn back. Yet I knew it was the journey inside that really counted. And in this moment, I was 100% committed to seeing it through. And here it is, the official end of the West Highland Way. This is it, we made it. Finally, six days later, sore feet statue. Ugh, feels so good. And you know, I can't believe this is the third time I finished the route because I don't know, you could question why three times, but the truth is that every time you do a trail, there's potential to learn something new. And for me, this time on the trail, I've learned so much about why people come and actually bother to hike this route. You know, I thought, well, I didn't think, but there's every potential that I'm the only one who's mad enough to do this, but it's simply not true. There are hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who head out and hike pilgrimages along trails. And it really reminded me as I've opened my heart up to the people on the trail, to the spirit of the trail, that this is my community, that this is where I belong. It's in nature and it's with the people that appreciate nature. And so that's a very grounding feeling for me because I can get quite lost in feeling like I don't belong it anywhere or fit in anywhere. But this trail has definitely showed me otherwise. So if you are looking for a place of belonging, for a community, I strongly encourage you to pack a big bag and head out for a long hike because no doubt you're going to find your people and no doubt you're going to learn a lot about yourself along the way as well. So guys, I want to say thank you so much for watching. It feels good to be here. And in the meantime, <laughs> whilst I take my boots off and relax, you get yourself ready and head out with your very own adventure. I hope you enjoy it wherever that takes you. And until next time, stay wild. I'll see you soon. You know, it was hard to leave Fort William that afternoon and I sat staring into a collection of daffodils, now framed by buildings rather than mountains. But that was the truth, really, that nature is everywhere. And so too are good people. The trail just narrows the distance. It brings you closer and makes you braver. You become more receptive to the kindness of the world, more grounded in the seasons and more courageous to push through the hard things. And best of all, you carry the smiles gained forever because we did it together. We need each other as much as we need the earth that we share. And that is why, for me, this is our trail, the West Highland Way. Thank you.